my recording is in progress, I'm sure. Okay, great. So um, can you guys see I have Illustrator up? In fact, this is one of those silhouette packs. Um, my guess is, <laughs> and this has been recorded, so I'm not sure if I should say this, but my guess is I saw this as a JPEG or a PNG file online. You probably had to pay for it, and I just pulled the PNG off and then uh, brought it into Illustrator and did a live trace on it to convert them into actual like vector vector objects. So I could change their fill and their stroke color um, quite easily, actually, <laughs> um, and, and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so, uh, and I'll show you guys how you can do that um, here in a minute. If you find a silhouette that you want to use and um, you need to convert to a vector or something, that's quite easy to do, actually, in, in uh, Illustrator. Um, but these are at your disposal. There's there's this one called Common People, um, which sounds kind of judgy, like, you know, commoners and I don't know, whatever. But um, it looks like a bunch of people and sort of business, business casual, and then occasional some some dog walking and cycling and things like that, um, or climbing a step ladder <laughs> or whatever. Uh, some umbrellas, you know, just in case it pours down rain at some point yesterday. It actually rained on me. Um, so you never know. Kind of weird. Um, there's groups of people that can be very helpful. So, you know, if you just have a few stray folks like silhouettes here and there, sometimes it doesn't look that great. So I highly recommend thinking about how to populate um, uh, these things, uh, these, these spaces as you start to make representations of them. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes we can, that, that sort of does two things, right? We can sort of, Take something that might look scaleless um, and give it some scale, right? So as soon as we recognize human figure, we sort of know the average size is somewhere in the five to you know size to six plus range uh, feet tall, you know, and we we start to understand scale through that, right? So we understand the size of things, um, it, even if it's not that obvious to to begin with. Um, two, we can also start to talk about program and, um, and activity and verb, right? We can start to talk about what these spaces might be used for, how people might might uh, 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 use them. And so, you know, we could have folks sitting on benches or um, playing racquetball or um, having a conversation um, in groups of two, three, or nine, or one, or whatever, or just sitting on their phone um, yapping away. Do people still talk on their phones? I don't know. I think all I always see is just people texting. I don't really see a lot of people talking, except for the annoying person on a hike that feels like they have to have their phone on speakerphone while they hike right behind you. It's really bizarre. I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway, um, so far, far be it for me to judge. I probably have weird things that people hate about me too. Um, here's some more, right? Um, you know, we could have somebody doing their, their karate uh, practice or um, reading what looks like a paper map. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Do they even make paper maps anymore? Uh, beats me. All right. So, or this guy from Mortal Kombat, the old Sega Genesis video game, oh, whatever. But anyway, um, tree silhouettes, really important, right? Uh, so um, again, I would, I would, uh, I don't see anything here that looks too out of the ordinary Um as far as maybe using them along streets in the desert, there are some trees that obviously don't belong. Um, and, uh, uh, but there are some, some palms and yuccas, some, some uh, uh, desert, desert like trees, and then some trees that you just commonly find. And sometimes they get planted in the desert as well. Some conifers, they, even though they don't really belong in this altitude. Um, we see them, I see them all along Fort Apache along some neighborhoods. So um, people use them. In fact, it's kind of weird how they they sort of groom them like they they started um, so that they actually can hang over the sidewalk and they don't sort of impede the sidewalk. Kind of a weird thing, but anyway. Uh, and with trees, as always, I I would say it's always about you know you might only have three or four different trees that you use from this in any given scene, but you have to sort of mix them up, mix them up in scale. Try not to repeat things, right, and make it obvious that you're repeating things. You'd be surprised how often. Uh, I'll see that. And, and it's just sort of a blind spot when you're just trying to get things done and you're like looking around um, to have somebody with fresh eyes sort of look at it and say, uh, you're using that tree over and over again. Like how can a tree possibly be exactly the same as its neighbor? Because they never are, right? Um, in fact, interestingly, trees are really nice. You ever look at trees when you're walking around? Oh yeah. 
you can always tell which way is south in the desert by looking at a tree. Um, you can always tell when it's up against a wall or a building or uh, it's it's shaded and it starts to grow out to where it gets the most sunlight. So there's like a diagram almost of uh, of the, the sun conditions uh, in the desert, a, a tree, you know, especially in these neighborhoods where they're you're up against houses and, and CMU walls and dogs pee on them and things like that. So, all right. Um, so here's the resources. Uh, so for, sorry, here's Canvas in module one. Here's the resources page and you can find all of these uh, here. There's also a tree silhouettes and plan, which, which can be helpful when we're looking at plan view later. Um, so I threw those in there as well because they were all in a package here. Um, then, uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about where we're headed with this and then we'll I'll show you some, some workflows to get there. Um, and within those workflows, um, there's lots of, I think, latitude for you to sort of take some artistic liberties, right? I think that's really important. I'm showing one possible way, just like if I was doing something with charcoal or pencil or watercolor or anything like that, right? Um, digital media is the same way. There's more, there's multiple paths to the same goal. Um, and there's more than one way to interpret some of those goals too. So uh, please submit your five planar composition axonometric drawings, right? So you've been doing these five models. Um, and so I'm just saying, make sure you find the, okay, so here's the deal, right? I, I expect five sort of axons. Now, some of you might be like, this is my favorite one. I can't decide on just one axon view. I'm going to include two or three. And that's perfectly fine. I don't care so much. But you do want to sort of populate things in, as we go. And I'll, I'll show you about that. So be sure to populate them with appropriate scaled entourage. That's what we typically call the sort of scenery that we add to sort of give it some context and make it sort of more believable. Humans for scale and activity. Um, street furnishings, right? If we're looking at, uh, you know, one of these corridors like Las Vegas Boulevard or Parson or Fremont, right? Or Sixth Street um, or uh, trees and those sorts of things, right? So they, they begin to suggest scale. They begin to um, hopefully uh, immerse the the modeling that you've done, the the, the compositions, uh, and make them look almost like the uh, they're, they're, they're real and spatial in some way, right? So there's a little bit of world building here. Um, now I will say these are silhouettes and so they're black right now, right? And that's why I've sort of kept them as vectors so we can adjust opacity as well as um, as well as a color um, if we want or to switch back and forth between let's say stroke um, and just having an outline uh, versus a fill. Um, because what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that the architecture is what's popping here. That's what we're trying to show. And so we wanna make sure that there's not too much contrast or that the trees, silhouettes and things like that, which become really dark black spots if you just pick, copy and paste them in the way they are now, right? They carry a lot of visual weight. And we want to make sure that the visual emphasis is not necessarily on a stray tree that we copied and pasted in from some silhouettes package that Vermillion gave us, but that the architecture stands out, right? So um, thinking about, again, we always have to think about these things, right? I use the word composition, right? Five planar compositions because we're composing a bunch of pieces and bringing order to them, spatial order. But then we're also situating them on a piece of paper with a frame that's a certain size and a certain dimension that you determine. I'll show you how to do that in Illustrator in a bit. Um, and you determine how people read, where their eye rests, right? Where their eye is drawn to first. Those are all tricks of our trade, right? The sort of elements of composition, things like balance, symmetry versus asymmetry, um, negative versus positive space, and visual emphasis, right? So um, by simply populating a page, and choosing a frame size and, and placing, positioning, drawing information on the page, whether it's mark making or whether it's um, taking a, a, a rendering or whatever it is that we're doing, um, we, we make decisions that have profound influence on how people read it, right? The size of the font, the type of font, um, where it's located, right? How much white space is around something or do we start to pack everything in in a nice tight grid, in which case, you know, where does the eye stop, right? Those sorts of questions um, will we'll constantly be sort of talking about um, over the summertime, right? Those are the fundamentals and we'll, we'll beat them into your heads um, one way or the other. You'll hear me be very repetitive when it comes to these things, right? So we'll talk about things like line edge uh, um, surface planes, right? Those are some of the, the components of design, um, but we'll also talk about how we communicate with them, right? And especially in this class, this is design communications media. 
All right. So, so contrast. We'll look at these and we'll sort of like start to, to you know move some things around. We'll start to try to, you know, the nice thing about the digital side of these things is we don't have to redraw everything from scratch if we make a mistake or we say, oh, that's too dark and I can't lighten something. Um, you know, when you're using graphite or some other media, you can always start light and go darker, but you can't go dark and then go lighter, right? So um, with uh, with with uh, digital graphics, it's obviously different. It's everything's parametric, and we can start to adjust those settings and parameters, um, and and fine tune things and tweak them and perfectly craft them, right? So uh, away we go. Um, let's see here. There we are. So the other day we were talking about some of these perspectives, and I I captured one out, and I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting, right? Um, and uh, so I, I'll be looking for you guys to sort of take these three for each of your models and just sort of compose them on a page as well and for, you know, a page each or something like that, whatever it is, or just submit the JPEGs. We'll talk about that at the very end. Um, but there'll be like sort of 15 quick perspectives just like this, you know, more or less um, do. And you probably already have some of those. If, if, if you don't, then it's probably pretty easy to sort of get. But again, I was talking about getting inside those models, looking at perspective, right? Um, what's interesting is that we'll look at these and then we'll start to compare them to precedents that we looked at for architects that really do a phenomenal job of, of looking at light as a material, almost, I would say, right? So they do splendid things with other materials like concrete or wood or whether it's steel or glass or whatever. But but um, folks like Stephen Hall or Tadao Ando or David Ajay, right? They're really good at sort of thinking about architecture as a canvas that can actually be painted with lights and shadows. So. Um, I would argue that, you know, once we start to look at that, it'll start to get our brains going in a different, uh, a, we'll, we can shift from second to third gear and sort of thinking about light and sun, right? Um, so here's one of those ISOs that I made quickly. And I'm just going to open up Illustrator. In fact, there it is. And I'm just going to go to File and New. This should be the same in Windows and in Mac. The interfaces for win between Windows and Mac are pretty close. Um, I might hit Command C and Command V to copy and paste, um, or uh, uh, but uh, you know it's Control C or Control V in the Windows side, of course. So I'm just going to go to File and New or Command New or Command N, I guess. It's going to bring up a box, and there's going to be some options here. So first things first. Annoyingly, I guess by default, since I just loaded whatever. New version of Illustrator, Creative Cloud wanted me to to install. It it's taking me to points. I don't know if anybody that looks at these and goes, yeah, okay, I want something that's eight hundred and forty one point eight eight nine eight points wide. Uh, typically, think in terms of inches or or millimeters, depending on if you're doing metric or, or imperial. Um, this actually looks like it might be a four or something, but it's really close to uh, eight and a half by eleven, but it's a little narrower and a little taller, so. Anyway, I'm just going to go to 11 and eight and a half or something like that. Why not? I'll try that. Sure. Uh, I could go with 11 by 17. Uh, and uh, then the question is, do I go with um, with portrait or landscape, right? So I'm just going to go with landscape and I'm just going to input one isometric into this page in Illustrator. But I'll show you how you can make more pages, et cetera. Color mode, CMYK versus RGB. CMYK, of course, is something you probably want to use if you're going to print something, particularly if it's going to be in a publication or a booklet. Book. If you're working with a publisher, they'll say, well, you know, uh, make sure that all the original illustrations are in CMYK or we're going to have to convert them for you. And hopefully the blacks are actually black and make sure that we have the right color profiles done. Because sometimes if you don't do it right, then, then this sort of stuff turns to sort of a gray scale-ish. The blacks aren't a true black, but actually kind of a dark gray. You can sort of see that, et cetera, right? So that's all to say that we're going to keep things digital. You're not going to be printing out a lot of stuff. So we can just go with RGB. And that way it'll look really nice on the web. Um, I'll just leave it as 300 PPI. That's not a huge um, that's not a huge concern for me because this is a vector, um, a vector editing tool, Illustrator. So I'll hit create. Now, what I mean by vectors, right, is uh, like, for instance, if I think about a JPEG that I download off the internet or take with, uh, photo with my my phone or camera, right? Um, I get something that's called a raster graphic. If I zoom in, you see that really this this uh, image is just a, a really tightly packed grid of squares, and each square has assigned a, a particular color. And uh, if I zoom in too much, then you start to it breaks 
breaks away from the uh, the effect of being a, an overall photo, and you just start to see the individual squares and individual colors in each square, right? So we understand that you know resolution is really important with raster graphics, photographs, and images um, like JPEGs and PNGs. Uh, uh, vector graphics are different, right? So they're they're basically lines, they're vectors, curves, and things like that. They they're even, there's mathematics behind them. And so as I zoom in on a on a curve, a line, it can redraw that line between those two points, and it never pixelates, right? I'm sort of zooming in, right? So it's not like here's a diagonal pattern of black pixels as opposed to the white pixels around it. Um, this is quite literally a line, and it re knows it as a line. It knows it as a, 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 a either an algebraic function or a polynomial um, or a, a parabola or whatever whatever sort of curve geometry or line geometries that we're using, right? And so it can then it can scale up, scale down. Um, you can begin to fill in the inside. There's an inside and outside for anything that's closed. Um, you know, when you have manifold sort of ge geometries in your your drawings, etc. Right. So, um, and of course. It has control points and we can move them around so I can, I can reconfigure them, right? Which is not something you can do if these things were a series of pixels. I'd have to like sort of get the eraser tool and then start to erase things or get the paintbrush tool in Photoshop, turn it to white and then paint this out and then get a, a black paintbrush and try to draw another line somewhere, draw draw uh, with the paintbrush. So um, that's fundamentally what we're talking about is different. What's nice about Illustrator is that it's also a nice uh, place to sort of compose things. Um, InDesign is good, and that's another uh, tool that we'll use towards the end when we're trying to make portfolios. It's specifically made for books and booklets and other sort of publications. Um, but when it comes to sort of posters, just sort of making quick PDFs, and um, there's a lot of things in, in Illustrator I want you to learn. We're just going to use Illustrator to sort of lay these things out for some of these deliverables, okay? So I've made an 8.5 by 11. It's in landscape mode. Um, and I promise you we'll get to, biz, uh, get to work right now. I'm going to go to File Pulldown. And here's what I'm looking for, place, right? So whenever I want to bring in imagery or bring in any kinds of like uh, Illustrator, other Illustrator files I've generated um, or images, JPEGs, PNGs, TIFFs, um, WebPs, anything else, uh, I, I can use the place command. So file place, it's kind of like insert or, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, import, but this it's called place in, uh, in Illustrator. I go to the desktop. And uh, here we go. There's my ISO, right? So I'm going to go ahead and click that. Now it's going to say, okay, where do you want to place it? I'm going to just click, click over here in the corner. You can see that's it's considerably larger than 8.5 by 11 <laughs> at 300 DPI, right? So you can see here's my original page size. I'm just zooming in and out by pinching on my my uh, my uh, notepad. Um, so a couple of keyboard shortcuts with all of the Adobe programs. This works between Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, right? If you hold down the mouse, or sorry, the space bar on your, your keyboard, then your left mouse button becomes a pan, so you can pan around. My scroll window actually just moves around, moves this thing around the screen and pans. Um, if you want to zoom in and zoom out, uh, for the Mac side, it's Command Plus and Command Minus. Uh, for the Windows side, it's Control Plus, Control Minus. If you just want to fit the document to screen, command or control zero, right? So that then brings the document and fills the screen. Now you can see again, I, I zoom out that my image doesn't fit on the screen, okay? So uh, several things I can do here, right? I have this thing selected. Let me just move this out of the way really quickly. Sorry, there's a part of the zoom interface is in the way. All right, so. I can drag and drop, or sorry, I can sort of drag and slide this thing around and try to try to scale it like that. Right. Now, I have to be careful or I can accidentally sort of stretch it. If I hold down the shift key on my keyboard, then I can sort of resize things and, and maintain the aspect ratio, okay? And again, that's another thing you'll find holding down the shift key with all of these programs constrains that aspect ratio so you don't accidentally stretch it and make it super tall or super wide and it looks really goofy, right? If I wanted to be very precise in my interface right now, um, I think it's because it's not stretched across the top all the way. If I give it a little more screen real estate where it said transform up here, now I can sort of really precisely give it an X, a Y position and then as well as specify a particular width and height. So just by manually stretching this, just, just eyeballing it, 
I turned it to a width of 10.5781 inches by five point something something inches. Um, it's obviously wider than it is tall, so I'll, I'll go ahead and constrain the width. And before I do that, I'm just going to double click this chain. This means that as I adjust the width, it'll also adjust the height and proportion, right? If it's not selected, then it, you'll have a sort of dash, right? So I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'll just type that to L, or sorry, to 11. And then you can see the height also adjusted. Um, so this position, 5.4 by 3.01, it's talking about, in this case, the middle point or the, the, the sort of centroid of the object that I have selected. I'm going to look at the top left. You can see that I'm off by 0.035 inches and 0.1 inches. So I'm just going to sort of type in zero and zero. Now I can sort of place this thing on the screen very precisely and fill the, the screen and um, with precision down to like five or six decimal points of accuracy, which is ridiculous actually, but you know, why not, right? Okay, so here we go. Now here's one of the drawbacks of having that ground plane and casting shadows on the ground plane, right? You can see that very clearly I have a, a bottom and it just sort of ends, right? And so it doesn't actually feel like it's floating in the page, um, but that you can clearly see that the, the image stops right here. So uh, maybe I'll just bring that down to the bottom. And, and, you know, again, an easy way of doing that, I can drag it um, or I can just say, okay, I'm gonna look at this bottom left corner and in X, I want it to be at zero and in Y, I want it to be at 8.5 inches, right? So now it's gonna be at the very bottom. Um, and I don't like the fact that this isn't centered, so I'd probably either change the the um, the document size, or I might I might just drag and drop this off and just again place it centered on the page. Um, that's a decision you have to sort of make at some point, right? Um, I also have some of these silhouettes up, so let me just copy and paste. I can just copy Command C, and then I can just Control V or Command V in, I can start to place scale figures. And again, these are vectors, so I can I can scale them up or down as needed in order to make them all the same size. Now, what I would say, or would advise you to do, is if you're gonna stretch these, these folks out, um, to do all of them at once. So start to, you might just, uh, I mean, here's what I typically do. I'll take these silhouettes, I'll put them all in here at the same time. And that way I don't have to keep scaling them all down as I bring them in and back and forth. I can do them all at once, get them all to the right scale. And then it's about dragging them in the right place. So again, I'm holding the shift key. If I don't hold the shift key, I can accidentally do something goofy like this, right? Nobody wants that, right? That suddenly those don't look so good, right? Or, um, so holding on that shift key constrains their proportions to something that's better. And I'll start with something like that. Sure, why not? I'm going to drag these off to the side. I can grab each of these individually. And I can start to place them. Here's somebody on the edge taking a photograph of the rest of the city. Um, get some people walking around. This person's asking this person something. Reach out and touch someone. This guy's in a hurry. This guy's stupid. I'm just going to get rid of it. Um, we could have some people sitting. Here we go. There's some kiddos along with some adults. Why not? Move them over here. I don't know where they're going. They're going nowhere, apparently. Um, you know, here's some people down again on the ground moving around. We can start to add some scale to these things, right? Um, I'm going to move somebody in there. Have somebody doing yoga up here on this platform. Have somebody posing over here on the runway. I don't know, whatever, but, um, you know, again, I wouldn't be too afraid to just sort of put a bunch of people in. You can always edit them out later, right? 
Now, what have I not been doing? I've not been putting these folks on their own layer. I should have done that before I started scattering them all around, right? So I can turn that layer on and off as needed. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And first of all, I'm going to my layers box. I'm going to hit plus sign. I'll call this one that I put in earlier, axon. And then I'll put this one, call this one um, humans, something like that. Um, I'll select all these silhouettes down here at the bottom. And I'll go ahead and drag those up. Um, I'll try to select everything over here. Now, when I drag my box in Illustrator, it's going to select everything that I, that box touches. So um, the uh, the rendering included, the axon drawing included. So I'm going to go shift uh, click that rendering to unselect it and keep everything else selected. And then I'll move this little blue box saying that all the things that are selected in the axon layer, and I'm going to move all the things that are selected to the humans layer. There we are. Now I can turn those things on or off as I need to. Or I can lock the axon layer. Now, when I need to select the humans, I can select them all at once without having to deselect the, the axon uh, again, right? And of course, I can look at the fill color. The fill color could be black or it could be, uh, let's see here, try to find some grayscale. Here we go. All right, maybe I tone them down a bit, right? So again, they don't pop too much. Um, they're there for scale and uh and program but not necessarily to be the, the the main focal point the main main point of emphasis so um yeah anyway um or you know here's kind of we can always play around with this right i could turn them to just outlines and in fact that point or that one point stroke weight looks a little weird with how small they are so i'll turn them down to 0. 0.5 now maybe they disappear a little too much maybe then i'll add a white, a white fill, right? And then maybe then I'll even turn down their opacity a little bit, right? So there's lots of different ways you can begin to play around in Illustrator with these things in order to to make sure that you you put these things in, um, but you're not. Uh, how do I say this? You're not. You're not overwhelming the viewer. With the wrong information right you want to make sure that the thing that you want to count really counts here right so um after i start to do this then suddenly um, these scale figures don't contrast too much with the architecture it helps my eyes sort of really focus on on this and and how how people are are populating it rather than the, like here's a bunch of silhouettes oh and there's some stuff in the background right we can do the same thing with trees i'll just go ahead and bring a few of those up Let's see here. And again, with the trees, there's nothing stopping you from just copy, paste the whole thing in here. And just go over here, paste these in. I can even move them off the, the page a bit here for a while. And while I have them selected, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead to the, the layers and I'm going to make a new layer again. Say trees. And I'll move everything that's selected onto the trees layer. And you can see that they've, it was just fitting. It's a green layer. Wow. What a coincidence. Trees aren't always necessarily that green, right? You know, sometimes there's lots of golds, olives, um, blues. In the desert, it's kind of a really, really fun thing because some of the trees have bark that's green right and then uh you know the palo verdes and things like that so um let's see that's all to say that sometimes the caricature that we hold in our head of some items are not too helpful when we're actually trying to represent them make drawings of them if you've ever seen the book drawing on the right side of the brain it's all about that right sort of trying to, to break away from the left side of your brain, which is the analytic side. And you see tree and it matches it up to the patterns of everything it knows about trees. Um, because you you when you're trying to actually draw something specific, you don't necessarily want to draw a tree. You just want to draw the shapes that you see, right? So there's a whole sort of method, cognitive method of sort of trying to break away from um, that sort of, you know, platonic sense of trees and apples or whatever else that you might be drawing in still life or in a scene or out in, and out in the field with your sketchbook. Um, blind contours where you don't look at the, the piece of paper at all, and you just draw the shapes in between, negative space drawing. So you're not drawing the subject, you're drawing all this stuff in between and around the subject. 
um, helps your helps your brain sort of shift gears um, into trying to take the recognizable and fit it in, put it in a box and then draw whatever you, you think is it, it should look like instead to see it as it is, right? So um, I can just sort of plop and place some trees here. You know, and I always like to think about trees as just something else that could be architectural and put in. So if I look at this sort of modules here, I sort of look at some of these lines that sort of project through. Oftentimes I'll think, you know, unless I was protecting or keeping some sort of tree that was already there, I'm going to plant trees in very particular places, right? Just like I would put a column in a very particular place or a, uh, um, or a surface or a plane in a very particular place or um, a path in a particular place, right? These things can frame, they can uh, uh, shelter, um, they can uh, be very, uh, uh, lead to very pronounced uh, axes and things like that. So um, if I think about this just for a moment, I might, I might begin to think about how that, that line sort of projects outwards like this. Um, how we might even create something that's somewhat tree-lined. I'm not sure why this tree is leaning so much. I'm just gonna, if I get my cursor over just a little bit, I can, I can just sort of tweak it, make it look a little more vertical. Typically the canopy will change according to the sun direction and uh, not necessarily the main stem. The main stem usually well, there's there's exceptions, of course, to everything, but all right. So I might put a couple of things over over in a few places. Now here's something interesting. I, I want to put something that's over here behind it. And that's gonna be that's gonna be difficult, right? Oh yeah, it is. Okay, so there's a way to deal with this. Let's say I want to put a tree back behind this, but it, the, obviously the tree is gonna be occluded. Um, parts of the tree are going to be occluded by the architecture, right? And so right now it looks like it's on the architecture. I want it to look like it's behind it, right? So the way we can do that is we can actually make a mask. And inside this shape that we draw for a mask, you'll actually be able to see the tree and everything outside of that mask, that the, the part of the trees that are outside that mask will disappear, right? So I'm going to actually draw a shape and make sure that tree... My tree layer is the active layer. I'm going to go ahead and lock the humans layer since I'm just dealing with the trees. And I'm just going to, now this is one place, Bijan, where I'm going to use the pen tool. And I'm just going to make sure that I'm very particular about click. 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 I'm just going to make a shape around that tree. Close it off. I'll go around and then I, I'll, I'll just tap that uh, that first point again to make sure that it knows it's a closed shape. Okay, you can see here that if I just switch this around, you can see, you know, if I turn the fill off and turn turn the stroke on, right? You can see the shape, and I'm just going to select that shape and going to select the tree shape underneath it. I'm going to say object, clipping mask, make, right. We'll use this object pull down a lot. So I'll just leave it up for a second or two. Um, we'll be doing things with paths. Paths are just another name for shapes. <laughs> um, we'll be doing some live paint. Uh, we can do some image tracing. Um, live paint, we can start to fill things in. Um, image trace, we can take a, a, let's say, a raster image of something and we can turn it into a vector um, image. And it, so, um, and we'll be doing some other things too with this. So I'm just to say make. What's going to do is it's going to turn that shape I just drew into a mask. So it disappears. And it's just a window now. Inside that window, I can see the thing that I, I masked behind it. And you can see that there's still, the tree is still here. I just can't see it anymore um, in the places where it looks like it should be behind the architecture. Okay, So that's one way we can begin to layer things up when we're dealing with uh, raster graphics and then trying to layer in some vectors underneath. Um, or behind, you know, sometimes we have to start to mask these things. It can get kind of complicated from time to time. Remember what's in front, what's behind, and, and those sorts of things. The ordering, so to say, of the, the, the layers of trace, um, as, as we would think if we were doing this uh, 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 manually uh, with some uh, analog tools. But um, And so now the trees are actually pretty dark as well. Um, so there's a couple of things. I can either tone those down. But first, I have a strategy right? I'm using for this the silhouettes. So I want to apply that same strategy to the trees. What's nice about that is I can select the tree. I can select this eyedropper tool. I could say, well, let's let's try to give, let's sample the properties from these. 
and give it to this, right? If I just use the eyedropper tool over here, you can do that with text. You can do that with uh, graphics. Um, now, interestingly, it gave me the mask. The mask I got to sort of pull off here. Oops. Here, let me go back in. I, I can double click on this mask group, this clipping group, right? Double click, and then it shows me the mask and the tree. I can just say, I want to do the mask, and get rid of it. All right. And uh, I like the tree, though. Maybe I leave it like that, right? And it could be the same thing over here. So I'll select the tree. The thing I want to, to change its properties, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, well, you know, I'm going to sample something else, the eyedropper tool. And I'll give, we'll do that, right? So if I like that, maybe I'll keep that. In fact, maybe, haha, this is where I get, you know, a little smart. If I, if I think about this, I could just do it for all of these, right? All at once, and then I don't have to do it individually anymore. Um, let's see. Here we go. Boom. All righty then. And now it's up for me to just sort of drag and drop these things in, in some particular places, right? So I could begin to overlap some trees. I could begin to put things behind or in front of um, in order to sort of give some... Or to give some depth to this, right? In order to give it some context. Josh. Yes. Can you can you uh show what your tree layer looks like now that you added that mask? Because once you get several masks, is this is this where you're gonna start grouping things? No, I don't necessarily have to do that. Yeah. So this is already grouped together, this clipping mask in the in the tree that's clipping, because I selected the shape and I selected the tree underneath. Um, when I made the clipping mask. So if I That's look in, under this, group. like here's a compound path, right? This is just a tree, right? Th these are all just, these are all just trees. Um, this is the only, this is the only mask or clipping mask. It's called clip group. And if I double click on it, then I can go inside the group and I can see that original mask. And I could change it or I could go in here and change the tree, right? And then when I okay, double click so... back out in the scene, I, I, it's just a group again. So it's not like Photoshop where each each mask is shown with the layer. No, layers in Illustrator work exactly like they do kind of in Rhino, right? Like you're putting things on layers and it's just a label um, that you can turn things on or off for lock or unlock. Yeah, or select. So um, it's very much like a, like a CAD program, like Rhino or AutoCAD or, you know, those sorts of things. Not like Photoshop where you can start to copy and paste different things in and um, yeah, because layers in Photoshop are a little different, even though they're they're mostly the same. I mean, they're kind of the same. But yeah, like when I do these these masks and things like that, um, they don't necessarily show up as different types of layers like they do in Photoshop, right? Like an overlay layer or a uh, a parametric. Uh, you know, if you do one of those layers where you uh, do a curve layer, right? You just adjust the curves um, or saturation or something right. like that. You know, you can begin to do those in Photoshop, which is nice, handy tool. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's not the case here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Um, I'll just get rid of these folks there. Now I have one of these. All right. Are you guys ready to see how we can make multiple pages in the same illustrator file? Yeah. All right. So this is the most counterintuitive thing I've ever seen. How did I figure this out? Of course, I just Googled it a long time ago. But if I'm using the Windows Workspace Essentials Classic, I have some settings up here at the top. And one of those settings that are always up there is Document Setup. I can click on that and it gives me, again, huh, do I want to look at inches? Um, you know, uh, and here I can edit artboards, right? So I went to Document Setup up here. Now in the box that pops up, I can say Edit Artboards. All right, and now I can I can resize this if I wanted to, right? I don't, I just wanna keep it at eight and a half by 11. I can make a new one and just by dragging and it's gonna snap around so it can, it can sort of line up with eight and a half there. Let's see if I can get it close to 11. Okay, it's not really close to 11, but now here in the properties, I can say, I want it to be eight and a half by 11. I can drag it away. 
right? I can start to make grids of these things if I want to, um, start to make a multi-page document, um, which is nice because you can actually save directly as a PDF and illust an illustrator. Um, so um, here's what it does. Artboard one, artboard two, artboard three. That'll be the 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 uh, the sequence in the the PDF that you make, um, right? This will be page one. This will be page two. This will be page three in the document because there's artboard one, artboard two, artboard three. So, all right. And so now I could come back in if I hadn't deleted all my extra trees and people, I could just drag them over here and and put another ISO in and start again, right? I could do that with perspective. Well, I do that with my perspective. Why not? I can just drag and place to just to place it in. I just did that for fun. Um, again, I'm just going to just quickly adjust this to 11 inches. Oh, sorry, that was Y dimension, not width. There we go. All right. That looks about centered. All right, placing scale figures in perspective, just a little different. Right. So first, I'm going to bring up my annotate tools and let's draw on this and zoom just for a moment. Let me bring those tools up out of the dock. There we go. All right. So first and foremost, for all practical purposes, we can just call this a one point perspective. The reason I say that is because it looks like we're sort of uh, parallel with certain um, certain edges and those par those edges then look like they they all. Uh, here, let me just draw it. They all sort of converge at a vanishing point that looks like it's right there. If I draw a little plus, right? Yeah. So all of those sort of edges that are perpendicular to our eyeball or to us, right? Or parallel to our eyesight. They all sort of converge more or less to a point that happens right there, right? One point perspective. And some of the horizontals, they look like they're fairly horizontal, right? Uh, if we went a little, um, if our vantage point was a little more oblique, then these things, I mean, technically these things would look like they kind of, they would technically vanish way off in space over here. But for all practical purposes, they can call them parallel. All right. So with that in mind, Right, we have this vanishing point. I think it's really interesting to sort of or to understand also where eye level is, right? So we have a horizon line through that vanishing point. And where eye level is, let's call this eye level. Right. Eye level for me is about six feet. Right. So what that means is if I'm standing up against this wall, that's six feet right there projected from the floor, right? Okay, now, six feet back here, eye level would still be the same, right? Because we're all eye level, if somebody's still six foot, right? Eye level is gonna remain the same, even if they are standing right there and their feet are right there, okay? So it's really important to establish eye level in order to make scale figures that look like they're all in the same scene. And then it's, you scale about that, you scale them about that eye level, right? To sort of place them in the scene itself, right? So let's just clear this out. And again, I'll just establish an eye level, right? And so, oh, sorry, I'm drawing uh, lines. That's, that's okay, here we go. All right, so that's as good as scale figures I'm going to draw with Zoom with a mouse and my my touchpad and Okay. So that's how you can begin to place scale figures. In your drawing, right? Where their feet hit the the floor is where where it starts to imply depth, where they are um relative to our camera. That makes sense. All right, great, fantastic. So now, when people are above us, like let's say somebody is up here in this space, right? That gets a little trickier, right? So 
what we would do is we would try to establish eye level. In this case, we could do it here, right? But again, we just want to be mindful of that. This person would be way up there. We wouldn't even see their feet, right? Because they're they're somewhere, instead of standing somewhere up there, right? Um, and maybe this person is actually waving to us. <laughs> maybe they're holding holding a bunch of balloons, or you know, you'd always you always like. Uh, it's funny when you see like these really um, really over the top sort of. Um, Photoshop collages and people holding popsicles and juggling and hop air balloons in the air and things like that. So um, anyway, so let's clear that out. Let's place some, with that sort of said, let's place some um, some silhouettes. You know, it, occasionally even in Ill Illustrator or Photoshop, either one, I'll either place a guide or a line showing me where that eye level is so I can just keep it. Um, let's do a guide because guides can be really helpful. And I haven't talked about those yet. There's a lot, to, I'm sort of unpacking, throwing a lot at you here, um, but I, again, I'm recording this. So you can always go back through it. And of course you can always just quickly ask me questions if you need to, as you go. So I'm gonna go to the view pull down. And one of the things I noticed is that rulers are not turned on. So I'm gonna go to view pull down and here I have rulers and guides and things like that, grids, right? I can turn those things on kind of like in the settings in Rhino, I can turn the grid on and off and the axis lines on and off and things like that. So this guy, I'm gonna say show rulers. Now, what's nice is that since this is the active document, right, um, you can see that the ruler starts at zero, zero in the top left and moves out this way. So 11 inches that way and eight and a half inches that way. So zero, zero is the top left. Uh, you're a document in Illustrator by default. If I want to change that, I could click and drag from the corner. I could set it over here. Now suddenly the zero and zero is down here, right? Or I can go back up here. Why not? Okay. And if I click and drag, let's say from the vertical ruler, I can create a set of guides. Those guides don't actually print and they don't actually uh, uh, show up in the PDFs or anything that you make from this, right? But they're there in case you want to start to make a grid, which again is a great ordering system for architecture. It also has to be a great ordering system for graphic design, right? It's no surprise that um, everything we look at is divided into grids, even when we look down on the earth through a map, um, the Jeffersonian grid is still there. And so um, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm just going to go ahead and select those and delete them. But I'm going to go ahead and pull down a horizontal one from the top ruler. And I'll go ahead and eyeball some sort of eye level right there. Why not? Okay. I can always move that around. Okay. Um, interestingly, if I go to view and I go to the guides, right, I can actually, once I have the, the guides in place, I can lock them so I don't accidentally drag them around and screw them up or accidentally select them and delete them or something. But uh uh, I by default I just sort of this is just a temporary guide. All right, and now let's get some people silhouettes. Uh, sure. Well, let's get some groups of people. Why not? Dun, 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 dun. Let's see. Okay, copy and paste. All right, now all of these are gonna to have to be independently scaled based on where they're pos positioned, right? But let's start with these two. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put their heads, try to around, around that eye level, and then I'm gonna drag them down this way and place them in my scene, right? So there's that guy's eye, for instance, right? And that might be different than these folks that are back there. Let's get some different folks. Let's see here. In the background there, why not, right? And this would continue again on this level. If this floor is the same level as this floor, then eye level would be the same, right? Um, so we can put in some, populate with some people in here. Yeah. Let's see here, let's bring them a little closer to us. They're walking in. Way off from the edge of the frame. Um, we could even have some people standing back here talking. Maybe these folks are going to talk to these guys. I don't know, whatever. 
Do, do, do. Make that person a little taller. Why not? And have them standing over here. Right. So that's how you can begin to place place folks in here. And again, if I wanted to have, let's see if I can find somebody good that could be standing up here, sort of peeking over or waving or something. Let me see here. What do we have? Or, you know, doing ninja chops or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Let's see. Walking the dog. I don't know what kind of dog that is. Let's see. Do I see anybody waving? And always again try to try to play out a story, tell a narrative, make it fun, make it playful. Um, I'll just use this guy. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. That's a really tiny person. Let's scale him up a bit. Oh, that's a hard hat. Okay, I couldn't even tell when it was that that small. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine where his feet are. I'm going to imagine if this if this was like let's say ten feet. I'll imagine this is ten feet. So I'll imagine from here to here being ten feet. So six feet would be right around here. Okay. And then I'm going to have to mask him off, right? So I'm going to I'm going to make a another shape. It's going to start over here. It's going to go all the way around him. I'll close. I'll select that shape. I'll select this object. Clipping mask and make. Now I'll just see this guy only inside that box that I that shape I made. And his feet are still there somewhere. But yeah, um, but they're just they're masked away. They're they're not inside the the viewport anymore. Okay. So that's how you can begin to add depth and and uh, perspective in in these. All right. And then, you know, from here I could say, you know, maybe I don't use the exact same strategy that I was over there. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, though I will bring the opacity down just a bit. You know, you see this a lot in Photoshop collages uh, sometimes where you don't want the, um, it, it's a throwback also, like back when we used to do um, what I would call uh um, the graphics courses I used to take a long time ago, um, Shrek graphics, where we'd use like uh, Pantone markers and things like that. Like you would see things through, you'd see things behind. And so um, trees and entourage might might sort of have that sort of slight uh, translucent or transparent look. And so, um, you know, in this case, it's sort of mimicking that as well. Right. Or maybe I just leave them as opaque, you know, or I, or I just, uh, Nothing fancy. I just use that, right? I wonder what that would look like if I did this. Yeah, I don't know. In perspective, I kind of like them to stand out a little more. I don't know. Maybe not. It's always up to you. I've always found that it's nice to have a classmate or you know somebody that you can just sort of say, "Can you look at this with fresh eyes?" What pops out? Like, what are you looking at? Like, where where's your eye stop or where's your eye drawn, right? Um, short of having eye tracking, you know, equipment, um, you can always just ask and, and sort of see what they think, right? Um, sometimes just having that, sometimes it's easier to do some critical, having a critical eye if it's not near, so near and dear to you and you haven't been staring at it to death for, for so long. You don't necessarily have to do these for the perspectives, but it'd be nice for you to try. Give it a try and see how it works. And the perspectives, I call those drafts, those 15 perspectives. Um, you know, they really are just at this point, I just want to make sure everybody's doing them, trying them. And if we can troubleshoot anything next week, then we will, okay? Um, for the axons, I'd like to sort of have those kind of wrapped up, right? We're not going to be done with that drawing axons and these, these planar constructs. So these are actually our starting point, our study models for some of the things we'll be doing in studio as we start to try to turn these into architecture with capital A. Um, and so, you know, right now they're just sort of compositions of planes and pieces and parts. Um, but with inside, both the form and the shape and the organization, as well as the sort of spatial and lighting and, and atmospheric qualities um, that you see in the perspectives, I think there's there's seeds for a lot of interesting ideas and directions you could possibly go okay, in your studio. And that's how I like to think about representation, right? That's the, the ultimate goal here in DCM. 
it's not that we do axons at the end or we do perspectives at the end or sections or plans. These things should be generative devices, right? These things should help us think through our ideas and possible directions in order to take them, right? Opportunities that we wouldn't see otherwise, challenges that we wouldn't see otherwise, um, juxtapositions that we wouldn't necessarily uh, get if we were just sort of um, staring off into space and just staring at our paper. But, but again, thinking through drawing, right? Is something that I would argue doesn't change between, let's say, graphite pencil um, and paper versus a mouse and a keyboard and, and uh, Rhino or Illustrator or Photoshop or AI even, right? So, um, okay. Um, last but not least, when I'm done with these things, I can go to file and I can, obviously I can save the Illustrator file. It's a .ai file. So I'll go ahead and save that. Ugh. I hate these boxes that look completely alien as if I don't know how to save something to my desktop. Like, come on. Um, all right. So I could say uh, planar compositions, doc, you know, whatever. I'll just go ahead and, and save that. Um, I'll just leave this as default. Hit OK, um, but I can also save as or export as a as a. Uh, oh, it's currently saving. Okay, I can save as or I can export. So save as I can save as a PDF. Really, don't show this again, please. Just save to my computer. Does anybody use Adobe Cloud? Maybe you do. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's really awesome, but I, I like seeing my stuff in one place, and I can back it up. I can make copies of it. I can attach it to emails. I don't understand this other thing. All right. So um, instead of Illustrator, I can say um, we can do encapsulated postscripts and those sorts of things for other types of uh, formats. But Adobe PDF is a pretty common one, right? So PDF is that portable document format. It's a, it's, it is a it's a standard. Like almost every computer out of the box can open up a PDF. You can't just edit the PDF, but you can open it, right? It's meant to be that sort of document that anything can, it's universal that anybody can read for these things right so save as pdf and i'll do that as well try sharing your... no i went to all this trouble and you're like are you sure you want to create a link no continue with the pdf please all right um i'll just say yeah i can make it compatible with the latest and greatest there are other standards here i'm just i'm just going to leave it default and say save pdf um and that pdf let me just open it up We'll just confirm, but I should have this as the first page, right? And then the perspective is the second page and this blank document that I made and it was the third. Um, and that's basically, if I go to document setup and artboards, again, artboard one, artboard two, artboard three, that's not a huge surprise, right? That's the order they're in. I can drag these around and, and, uh, and arrange them however I want, right? Make grids and things like that. Or maybe I like to read from top to bottom instead of left to right. Uh, when I'm making these things, setting them up or whatever, or I don't need this third one anymore, I can delete it. Okay. All right. So what questions do you guys have? Anything offhand? Mm -hmm. the, the if first... you make a clipping. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Bajan. Um, okay. Just real quick, the the first axon view um, you have in that artboard one that was yeah. in is that the um, the two D view? Yeah, that like was a, a so that was an axon view in Rhino using the uh, um, using the technical just viewport mode, display mode, the stuff that we did earlier in the week. Right, you can see there's those yeah. hidden lines, then turning on the shadows yep. and shading. Right, so, and I just captured that out. You want me to show you that process really quickly, just to, to be sure, like how we got to this. I can do that really quickly. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, I think I know. I just want to make sure that I was in the right view when I um, started adding these to Illustrator. Yeah, and then where when while Parallels is firing up, Bijan, what question did you have? Your view. my question was just based on um, your your clipping mask of that construction worker, like. Uh -huh. In the event that you wanted to move him to another place and you didn't require that clipping mask anymore, right? You just double click into it and then delete the mask. 
You could, but it's still probably a clipping mask link. So if I click on this and I go back to clipping mask, I can say release. Uh -huh. And now suddenly I have the mask again in the, the human and I can get rid of the mask. Okay. So it's awesome. editable through that object pull down, right? So it's the same thing with the live paint and the, the image trace and those sorts of things. You can you can release, you can expand. Um, we'll talk a little more about those, but but releasing it just sort of says, okay, forget about it. Let's just undo that and let's make them two separate things again, unrelated to each other. Is, is live paint something that you use for post-production too? Sometimes, like it, let's say I didn't have the soft shadows and I just wanted to like, Sort of give uh, like uh, here. I'll, I can show you an example of that. Let me let me do the Rhino part first, really okay. quickly. Okay, cool. And then I'll show you guys some live paint, and I can also show you um, show you guys the live trace, which is how I got those silhouettes from an image file. Okay. In fact, while I'm doing that, uh, I will resist trying to to select check my email since I have ten now after I had it cleared out before class. Let's see. Silhouette. Let's see what happens here. I, I always misspell silhouette. I always put two L's for some reason. Why? Um, just not one of those words that choose area. What? No, just go to images. Come on. This isn't difficult, right? So um, so this is actually quite literally an image. In fact, look, free pick, free people silhouette. Maybe I did get them for free. I don't know. But let's just look at this, right? So this is actually a blurry. Um what kind of photo is that or picture is this? It's a PNG. Oh, so that might actually have a PNG file. Let's see here. Ah. I just gotta let this open up. And I just wanted to get that started while I get Rhino firing here. Always trying to multitask. Busy guy, you know how it is. Okay, so open image a new tab. I'll just look at that. All right, so that I can save, um, maybe. Save to downloads. Sure, why not? And then here's Illustrator. I'm just going to make a new uh, a new artboard here. OK. <laughs> sure. All right, so um, here I am. And here are those silhouettes. Um, but they're they're quite literally an image. Um, so if I zoom in, you can see they're pixelated. Um, what Life Trace does is it can take an image and you can actually convert it into image trace, convert it into um, a vector image. So now it smooths things out. So there's a number of things you can do here. There's lots of different settings. So you can say it's a high fidelity photo, and then it'll actually start to pick similar colored things and make shapes out of them, and it'll look very particular. Um, these were silhouettes. So I'm just going to say silhouettes. And it's going to be like, oh, OK, these are silhouettes. And then once I have that, and with image trace, I can say, I can release it to undo it, or I can expand it in order to say, OK, I don't want it to be a raster graphic that's been live traced. I just want to have the vectors again. And then so those converts them into vectors. And I can ungroup them. And now I have, now I have a set of silhouettes, right? So if you find trees. Um, you can always turn them into silhouettes, or if you find tree silhouettes of your own or human silhouettes of your own, um, that live trace. I know that's a really quick crash course, um, but you can always Google that and you can find a lot of YouTube videos showing you exactly how to do that too. Um, and you can sort of see what those uh, what those other settings look like. Um, here we go, bringing up Rhino right now. Let's see, getting started tutorials. I wonder what those are like. Yeah. Let's see here. Sometime today, the planar composition example. I'll go ahead and open up that one up right now. All right, so um, first things first, I'm just going to open up this model for one of these planar compositions. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Ah, uh, but it works so well now. Oh, yeah. Take away the use of like, the software for a week and then you come back to it and it's like it's like a hot rod first week you own a new car or something again everything works and feels so good sounds good let's see come on maybe i spoke too soon all right here we go okay so 
right now it's at the perspective and there's a one uh, here. Oh, by the way, did I show you guys how to save views? Like if you get the perfect perspective and you want to save it to come back to it later? You might you go have, to, but I don't remember. If you go to set view and you go to named views, it'll bring up a box. Right? And let's say I really like this perspective a lot. I can say save that perspective. And I'll call this um, perspective 01. Right? Now if I... Um, what's going on here? I saved it. Okay. Now if I accidentally screw something up, I, you know or I'm in top view or something even, and I just want to go back to that perspective, I can get right back to it. Um, and then of course I can go to example from Tuesday to leave me later. <laughs> and that's that's that again. Um, so bringing these things out, let's see, uh, let's go back to top view for that. Oh, come on. Sorry, this is so annoying. It's been really laggy on me for some silly reason. I'm not sure why, but go to top. There we go. And oh, it's because I have several. Never mind. I'll just go to rendered or something like that. And I'll pop out. Um, I'll go to perspective view and I'll change this to ISO. And I don't remember which one I like the most. I'll just go with southeast because that was right there. Um, I look at this. I don't like that ground plane. I'm going to go ahead and turn that ground plane off. Let's see here. Let me get that off. There we go. So going to my render settings, uh, ground plane off. Oof. Hopefully it turns off. Huh. Well, at any rate, do I not have a ground plane here? Oh, I wonder if the ground plane's turned on in the actual viewport, the display. But anyway, um, regardless, once I once I have this exactly the way I want it for my ISO, right? I can go to view pull down, capture to file, right? So view pull down menu, go down to capture. Then it pulls out over here to file. This will then allow me to tell it, do I want a transparent background or not? Make sure I have the right viewport selected. See the size of the viewport window. So I can see the size of the, the resulting image that's going to pop out in pixels. I can decide whether I want to scale it. Once I'm ready, I can hit OK. And it asks me, where do I want to save it and what file type do I want to save it as? So if you get used to PNG, that's a nice universal type. Doesn't it's not completely lossless, but it doesn't uh, doesn't uh, um, you don't lose as much quality as let's say a JPEG. Plus, it preserves alpha channels. So if you have any transparencies in there, it'll work. Um, you can save it to the desktop then and, and give it a file name. Okay, so that's that's simply the a PNG file that I produced and brought in, placed into in Illustrator, right? Um, so that was the file pull down at the very beginning in Illustrator in place, or just dragging and dropping. Um, I covered mask and let's do some live paint. Why not? Oh, what's it doing? Yeah, the scroll wheel on, on the Mac is a little, a little off putting. Let me just close some of these things out. I have a lot of things open too. No, don't save. No. I say don't save just in case I accidentally dragged something around or deleted something. I, you know. Uh so I'll for instance, I'll use this example, right? This looks like a massing diagram from some other maybe class, right? Um, so this was a make 2D uh set of drawings from Rhino. Um, here's make 2D, but then with uh if I go to layers, it looks like I have um some sort of rendering underneath. Oh no, I don't. I have a live paint, right? So um, here's what I was doing with these. Let me just look at the color palettes here. All right, you can see that. Um, so I have these vector graphics. Um, so this was, uh, we talk about life paint really quickly and we can do some of these things for our diagrams next week. Um, I can select all of these graphics. I'll just make a copy of them. Copy and paste them over here. 
let's say I don't want to uh, bring soft shadow rendering underneath or something like that. I would just want to give it um, this sort of flat shade look. Um, what I can do is I can select these graphics. Try to just select them. Okay. Go to objects and say, make a live paint group. So live paint and make. So I'll group them all together. Now, when I come here and here with a, uh, it's not obvious where it is offhand, live paint bucket, right? Um, it'll look at that group and it'll say, okay, I can find close shapes. And what color do you want me to fill in inside of that? So I can go no stroke. And then for a fill color, I can say, let's go with CMYK, uh, magenta. I could say, okay, everything facing this direction is going to be magenta. And everything going this direction will be a slightly lighter, lighter value of magenta. Um, has a little more light shining on it. And everything on top will be like a very, very light shade of light, light tint of magenta or gray or whatever, right? It's just a way to sort of give it some flat shading. Um, you know, if you don't want to uh, get that back, I just use the eyedropper tool to get this value back. And I'll go back to the paint bucket and I forgot to fill that one in or whatever. Um, so that's, that's basically live paint group. Now it's all grouped together. Um, if I made a mistake and I just want to get rid of all of it, um, I can uh, release it, or if I want to now make it just a bunch of vector, uh, um, keep the life paint uh, colorations fills, but I want to uh, 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 make it so I can edit them again, I can just expand them out. Um, I think by default, then they're grouped together, I can ungroup them. Um, and now you can see that I have these things, uh, which is kind of interesting to have without the edges, honestly, sort of pop artish looking, you know, like the screen prints that you do, Dijon. <laughs> Interestingly enough. Anyway, so that's uh that's uh uh life paint, right? Um so Josh, you basically use that for strictly for diagrams or is that uh, there's no other sometimes I use it. Yeah, I mean I don't yeah, I mean I'll I'll use it for like diagrams. Like these massings and things like that, you know, maybe. Okay, cool. Yeah. You know, the key thing is I'll use color. Like I wouldn't normally just do this up here, what I just did. I typically use color to show like what I'm actually operating on or what I'm, you know, especially if I'm sort of snapshotting something, like each snapshot will have a very particular uh, use of color just to highlight what I want the viewer to sort of understand. You know, if you add color to everything and suddenly nothing has emphasis, right? So I use, I usually try to typically use color very sparingly um, or try to in order to uh, um, add emphasis, add visual emphasis where I want to, right? That's another way of doing it instead of just using um, dark tones, right? So color can be a, a way of reinforcing, you know, visual emphasis, obviously, as you know. Although there's something, I love seeing this without the line work. It's very, very Pomo-ish, uh, uh, post-digital sort of looking vector stuff, right? That seems to be in right now, so, you know. All right, at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing and stop recording. And then I'm, I'm around to just sort of help 